Hey YouTube. Hey guys. Yeah, I want to talk today a little bit about exposure and how I get exposure um, with the different devices I shoot with. Sometimes I'm shooting with an iPhone 10, which is actually a really good camera under certain circumstances. Sometimes I'm shooting with the D850, which is what I'm using now to shoot this vlog. Sometimes I'm using my mirrorless Z6. Now all of these devices have different tools and features that we can use to get a good exposure. So I want to talk to you about those and show you some of the differences between these different devices. There is a reason why DSLRs are in a higher price range than iPhones, even though sometimes you might take photos from both and not even be able to tell the difference. And we're going to talk about some stuff like that and maybe what's best as an option moving forward if you're looking to get in some video and doing some of that stuff. So what we're going to do is take the 850, the Z6, and my iPhone 10 and the Atomos outside and we'll kind of go over some of the feature sets of each and I'll show you how I expose also keeping in mind skin tones right very very important um, even more so than highlights and shadows most cinematographers will tell you that exposing for the skin tones is the absolute most important thing people have been looking at people all of their lives and when they see a person that has a greenish tint to them <laughs> or a yellowish tint to their skin they pick up on it immediately right and so it's very important that skin tones are very accurate more important than highlights and more important than shadows that being said we want to use all the tools in here that we have to try to properly expose the entire environment and we're going to go over that now so I'll see you guys outside okay I think the sun is getting ready to come up it's real quick here in Vegas we get flash storms they just fly right over the valley Las Vegas is actually in a valley. A lot of people don't know that. I didn't know that until I even moved here. But the entire area in a 360 is surrounded by mountains. And it's kind of like pretty good elevation. Las Vegas, we're at like 2,000 feet above sea level. But even though that we're 2,000 feet above sea level, we're in kind of what you call a high desert. And there's mountains all around us. And so we get these weird storm patterns that come through here. Um, but anyways, I've got my phone and what I like to do, there's just so many applications out there that you can use for Android or for iPhone that can help you extend the power of your phone. Um, today my iPhone has built-in features that Apple gives me in the operating system, right? Um, but there's apps you can download. The one I like the most is called Filmic Pro, okay? Now Filmic is free. You can go get the free version and use it, but it's limited as to what you can do. Um, I think you can control shutter and a few other things. But to get full control of your exposure, meaning shooting manually, uh, you need to buy it. I think it's like eight or nine bucks um, for like a lifetime. So it's a purchase worth making. And pretty much any time I pull out my phone, I'm using Filmic. And so I'm just going to give you an idea of the kind of footage you can get using this app. Okay, so with Filmic, the circle that you see is basically a spot meter. So wherever in the frame the circle is, the camera will assume the entire frame is that exposure. So if I put it up by the sky where it's bright, it's going to bring the entire frame down to be darker, trying to darken the sky. If I leave that circle in a dark area, then it's going to try to make everything much brighter, assuming that the entire frame is dark. Um, right now we're set to auto, so it's not functioning, but it's just for you to know. Since the iPhone footage is actually so good, and it is good enough that you can use it for vlogging, and I showed you the stabilization built into the phone, but now I'm going to show you stabilization outside the phone. And I see the Zion Smooth 4, and that's this gimbal. I'm going to turn it on. It's going to connect. It says connected. So now the functions I have here on my physical gimbal, the buttons, will work within Filmic. They've been mapped into the app, so it's really, really cool. Okay, I want to show you some of the features in the Filmic app. We're going to start with the resolution, and you can see the aspect ratios to choose from at the top. And in the middle, you can see that right now we're HD 1080p. We're going to switch that over to 3K. We can go to 4K. Okay, even 2K. There's all these different resolutions. Frame rate, well, we can do cinematic 24 frames a second, 30 frames a second. 
We can go all the way up to 120, 140 frames a second. We can choose our microphone and our audio. We can save our video straight to our camera roll, or we can save it into the app for further editing. The hardware tab will let us connect to any kind of physical device that we might be using, like the Zion Smooth 4 stabilizer. Okay, you can't see my finger doing it, but I'm pushing the stabilization option at the bottom left. Look how stable the footage is. Now I've turned it off and you can see it shaking. And we'll turn it back on and there's very stable footage once again. Now this is software stabilization. Hardware stabilization is far better, so stick with gimbals if you can. But this does work well when you're in a pinch. Look at the different lens types we can choose from. Telephoto, zoom, and then the back camera selfie in a wide angle. It's almost like I had a DSLR. <laughs> Okay, so I wanna show you a few more controls. Along the left edge and the right edge, you're going to see some transparent control wheels pop up. And on the right, I can control my focus or I can control my zooming. And on the left, my shutter speed and frames per second. My white balance, I can make it static to a specific number or turn on auto white balance. Here we can save videos and view them. And now I'm zooming in and out with the control on the right hand side of the screen, just the touch of a finger. So let's see if this exposure will actually re-expose for that blasting sun outside. And it did. And it starts recording on the camera by just hitting my record button here. I can use this to rack focus. I can use this wheel to um, change aperture. Um, so that's really cool. The electronic stabilization built into the iPhone is good, but anytime you're using electronic stabilization, you're gonna run into that you know weird warpy type of look sometimes around the edges. So I stick with a physical type of stabilization if you can. Okay, so as you can see, there's a lot of control that you can have in your phone. I can control my ISO, my shutter speed. Now, like I said, you've got limited glass and you've got limited sensor. So this isn't going to do great when you're at a concert, right? This isn't going to pick up all the details in the shadows <laughs> when you're shooting uh, a high dynamic shot. So keep that in mind. Break out the phone when there's a lot of light and you're really okay with everything being in focus at once and you'll get great shots. This footage is as good as any 4K footage off any other camera or DSLR. Uh, it's just the fact that you're limited and it has to be the right situation. Okay, hi YouTubers, I'm back, and yes, I'm wearing a different shirt, and yes, it's a different day, and, and I'm sorry I couldn't get this whole video done in one day. Um, also, just a disclaimer, I know we're talking something about exposure, but I just wanna be clear that I do know that this is not an absolutely perfect exposure that I have on my frame. Um, I'm just kind of running and gunning and I wanna get this video done, so bear with me. So we just talked about the Nikon Z6 mirrorless camera, right, 24 megapixel, and how it is so video centric and how it is so well built. Well, it is from a hardware perspective, but it's missing so many tools for exposure that it's almost useless without an external recorder. So I would not suggest running out and buying a Z6 mirrorless camera and think you're gonna run around and get great video. Under normal circumstances, you're gonna have a lot of trouble trying to properly expose things like skin tones and uh, people in the background or foreground of an image. So it's really important that when you get the Z6, you need to couple it with an external recorder, okay? Preferably the Atomos Ninja 5. If you get the Atomos Ninja 5, you'll be able to shoot raw and be able to collect details in that raw footage. The only camera that is a full frame sensor that can shoot raw footage that is a handheld mirrorless camera or DSLR is the Nikon Z6 and it's, we're still waiting for the firmware for that but it will be the only camera in the world that's doing it, 
okay? Panasonic makes a wonderful camera, but it's a micro four thirds sensor. It won't perform in a concert the way a full frame sensor will. Full frame's letting in a lot more light. I put my camera in the cage. Now the cage isn't there for protection. A lot of people think, oh, you buy a cage to protect our camera. No, no. The cage is there so you can mount more accessories. 99 bucks will get you a great cage, custom, that fits exactly the size of your camera. From there, I can put a microphone, I can put an LED light, I can put an external recorder, all on this unit, walk around as a single unit, and not be pulling and putting tension on the body of my camera. Also, a cage is useful because I can attach handles. The further your hands are from the sensor of a camera, the more stable your footage will be. So when you're holding a little camera like this and trying to shoot, every vibration is emphasized, okay? But when you're like this, and when it's a little heavier of a rig, okay, there's a lot less vibration to fight. Now, we're gonna look at the Z6 Nikon mirrorless camera. We wanna take manual and full control of that camera. And I'm going to show you the tools in that camera that we can use to get a good exposure and then show you how to use those tools to get it done. So what is exposure? Well, exposure is what the person shooting assumes is the right amount of light on the subject that they want to be viewed. So exposure may not be the same across the entire frame, you might have somebody in front that's properly exposed, but in the back, there's some people that are darker. A lot of times we use light to compensate for low exposure in areas we need to. I'm doing that in this example right now. So here's a great example. Right now, outside, the sun is shining, it's blasting light in through this window. And what I've done with the camera that's filming me right now is I've exposed so that the outside looks normal. Okay, but when I do that, what happens to me is I look like this. I'm gonna turn off the lights that are on me and you can see what normally would happen uh, if I exposed for the outside. And, oh, that's the red light. And that's it. This is what I would look like. Now the outside is properly exposed and uh, the autofocus doesn't know what to do, so it's hunting around. And now I'm going to turn on the lights. I have a key light above me, and then I have a fill light on my side. I'm going to turn on the fill light, okay? And that's to help give me a little fill on this side of my face. And now I'm going to turn on the key light. And there we go. So now I've exposed for the brightest part of my frame, whatever's in my frame that's the brightest. And then I've added light to the darker areas so that it can equal the exposure outside. So the first tool inside this camera that I wanna talk about, and probably the most important, is your histogram. And if you're a still photographer, you probably heard of histogram and, and you know what it is. Ultimately, your histogram will take a look at the data hitting your sensor and let you know whether or not the pixels are blown out, too bright so that they don't retain any data anymore, they just become white pixels, or if they're too low and underexposed and they're just dark and just black and not retaining any detail. And we need to stay within those boundaries. The histogram lets us do that. It lets us know when we've gone too far bright or too low dark. Okay, so we're done. Histogram. <laughs> That's it, that's what the Z6 has in terms of getting an exposure. And this is kind of problematic. Nikon went out of their way to develop a camera that is gonna be video centric and its main focus is for video. And it's excellent in low light. And its main focus is for video. And it focuses very well in low light. But they've decided for some reason to leave all of the tools that you need to get a good exposure, they left those out of the camera. I, I don't, we don't understand why. So if you look at some other cameras that are video centric, like uh, Panasonic GH5, as an example, packed full of tools, packed full of tools. Okay, so the very first option is resetting the movie menu um, and that'll set all the defaults. Um, next option is naming our file, and we can use three characters to preface our file name. 
Uh, next option is choosing an image area, whether it's full frame FX or crop sensor. Uh, then we have resolution. Look at all the different resolutions to choose from. This is 4K at 30, 25, 24 frames a second. I can shoot 1080 at 120 frames a second. I have all these options, and I can do baked in slow motion, where I'm five times slower, four times slower. For movie quality, I'm not sure what this is. Always leave it on high. Um, MOV or MP4, uh, they're both good. MOV carries a little higher quality audio. For auto ISO, you can set this to what you like if you're using it, but I never use this. For me, it is of the utmost importance that I have full control of my exposure. At no point do I want my camera deciding for me how much grain or noise will be in my um, film. Okay, and auto white balance is a no-no. Um, white balance is basically the color of light. We want to make sure we statically assign this and that it stays the same the whole time we're shooting. The last thing we want is a bunch of different footage with different white balance. It'll take forever to color correct. Set picture control is to choose a color profile. Right now it's set to portrait. You know, there's neutral, there's standard, vivid. Manage picture control is to load or save a custom picture control that you've created. Active delighting is basically lifting the shadows in camera. We're gonna leave that off. Vignette control off. Diffraction compensation, we don't want that. Auto distortion control for the lens, no thank you. We'll do it ourselves in post. Flicker reduction. Um, well, that's for uh, like fluorescent lights that actually flicker. Um, <clears throat> our country in the United States, we are a 60 hertz country, so you could set that to 60 hertz. Matrix metering is where we want to be for most of our metering when we're shooting video. Sometimes center weighted works okay. Focus mode, we're going to do full time autofocus. It's constantly the whole time trying to focus. Um, that's using the autofocus feature. Other than that, I'm manual focus 90% of the time. Now, autofocus area mode is how wide of a focal point uh, uh, are we using when we're telling the camera where we want it to focus. Electronic VR should stay off. That is software-based VR, and it creates weirdness in your video. <laughs> Um, all of the audio features, um, you know, turn them on if you're using them, turn them off if you're not. It's not rocket science. Okay, <clears throat> now there's a, two other autofocus features I want to show you guys under controls. And what you'll see is there's controls for the autofocus. AF tracking sensitivity means if I'm shooting an object and another object goes in front of it and moves by, how long should I stay focused on the original object? Or should I jump and switch to the object that moved and went by in front of me? And I can make that slow response or fast response. The AF speed is just if I change my autofocus from something near or far, how long does it take for the autofocus to make that motion? Now, I have tested these extensively, and I'm going to be honest with you, they don't work as good as you might think they should. I don't use them. Focus manual. If you're not shooting an interview and you're taking your cinematography even halfway serious, you should be learning how to focus manually. Learning how to pull focus, rack focus, is one of the tools in the director's toolkit. You should learn it. So let me introduce you to the Atomos Ninja 5. This is an external recorder. We add an SSD hard drive to the back of this recorder. We use HDMI to go out of the Nikon Z6 and in with a cable to the external recorder. The Atomos has a whole bunch of exposure tools and um, this is really the cream of the crop. This is, you know, it doesn't really get much better than this when it comes to handheld um, video recording. The Atomos was built specifically with Nikon Z6 in mind, along with other cameras. But um, Nikon has worked with Atomos. They both have intellectual property that no one else has. And so because of that, they were able to create uh, a protocol of raw video footage over an HDMI line. And nobody else can do that. No one else is doing that at all. Even the Panasonic is doing internal raw. So this is great. It's groundbreaking 
for Nikon and it's groundbreaking for Atomos. So why Nikon, right? Why did Atomos choose to go with Nikon? Nikon isn't very well known in video. Until this effort, they haven't really even been working towards it. So why Nikon? Well, the answer to that is Nikon has nothing to protect. Canon, Panasonic, Sony, they all have cinema cameras that they sell. They sell lines of cameras that are eh, starting around the seven to $10,000 range, right? They're cinema cameras. They're, they're made ergonomically to hold your hand for cinema. Um, they've got all the cinema tools packed into them. Um, generally, their sensors are probably a little bigger. Um, they're made for video, they're cinema cameras, and they cost a lot more money. Well, they all have to protect that line. So if you want to shoot raw and be able to collect all that data, get that higher dynamic range and process all of that information in post, you have to use a cinema camera to do it. Today, currently right now, there's not a single handheld mirrorless camera that can shoot raw like that. Not full frame. So this is groundbreaking. Nikon has decided to go ahead and open up and work with Atomos because they don't care. They, what are they going to lose? Of course, let's, let's shoot RAW in the Nikon Z6. Let's shoot RAW on a $1,700 mirrorless camera. Sounds like a good deal. What do they care? Sony and Canon, they'd be absolutely insane to put RAW into their handheld mirrorless cameras. If they do that, no one's going to buy their $10,000 cinema line. Nikon doesn't have a cinema line, and so Nikon's going to excel in the handheld RAW space. And here's an Atomos, and this is one of the tools. Here's a waveform tool. When this data gets to the top of the chart, the pixels are too white and blown out. When they're at the bottom of the chart, they're too uh, dark and there's nothing but black pixels. Now, as I move my aperture, you can see that it gets brighter and darker. You can see the highlights as they move up to the top and then back down. It's important to make sure nothing is too far at the top or too far at the bottom. The scale that's used on the waveform from zero at the bottom to 100 at the top is called the IRE, and the IRE stands for something like International Radio Engineers or something like that, but uh, they came up with the IRE scale, and uh, it's used to determine uh, how bright or dark the pixels are and how much data they contain. Now I can make my waveform smaller in the corner or I can make it large to get a better look. I can use a, I can use an RGB and this shows me each different color and where it sits. And I can make it huge if I just really want a big look and I'm looking at the RGB scale of the waveform. Another tool on the Atomos is what we call the vector scope. And all around the perimeter is the rainbow. This big white blob shows us that, shows us which way the colors are leaning towards and how to correct it. Another tool is focus peaking and you can see the yellow highlights letting us know when things are in focus or out. Here, and here are zebras and zebras are just diagonal parallel lines uh, that appear anywhere in my exposure when I've blown out highlights or my highlights are too bright. It's kind of like a warning system. So I turn on my highlights and you can also see back at the waveform where my highlights are. They're reasonable and they're not blown out. Okay, you can see at the top of the scale that they're not at the top yet. So now I'm gonna move my aperture way down from 11 down to like 5.6 or 4.5. And you can see now in the Atomos, up in the sky, you can see a pattern of zebras, and the waveform also shows my highlights overexposed on the IRE scale. And as I move that aperture and stop back down to 9, 10, you can see those highlights recuperate, and you can see on the blue sky behind that the zebras are gone also. And yet another tool called false color. And this lets us know from a color palette what's too bright and blown out or what's too dark. The brightest pixels you can see are red, like a stop sign. The yellow is a warning. And then as you get into the shadows, there's blues and greens uh, to let you know uh, when you're losing data on the low end as well. Here's a false color chart and it matches the colors up to the IRE scale. And you can see that at 110%, um, red and you know that's a no-no and that you're really going to have just white pixels 
at 100%, you're orange, and then you can see the colors go, uh, you know, from yellow to green. And then in the, in the mid tones, you're going to have like green and pinkish and, and, and then blues into purple when you're too dark or you're at seven IRE and lower. And dealing with skin tones, I would tell you that just in general, I would make sure my skin tones did not have much yellow in them right? And not much of the dark blue in them. And I'd want my skin tones to fall somewhere between, um, I'd say like a 35 or 40 IRE and a 70 IRE. And if I do that, I know for certain that there will be no shifts of color in my skin tones and there won't be any color shifts and that my skin tones will look just fine. Okay, so what we're looking at here is the difference between 8-bit and 10-bit video. And the bits really just mean how many different colors can be contained in the information of the video file. So with 8-bit, you're going to get 256 red, 256 green, and 256 blue different colors. That's 8-bit. And believe it or not, that's actually not a lot. And you can see that there's banding in the sky, or you can actually see it's not an even gradient. Now with 10-bit, you're talking about over a billion colors. And so there's so many colors with 10-bit that the sky doesn't do this color banding thing, and it looks much more um, of a seamless gradient. And so this is the kind of video footage that we wanna be able to shoot. The higher the bit rate, um, the more color information can be stored. And then also in post, the more we can push and pull colors, meaning that I might wanna shift, say a green to be aqua, or uh, maybe a red to be more of a maroon, and I can shift and change colors without the video breaking apart. With 8-bit video, I can't really push colors at all. So the video just falls apart, it gets all noisy, and there's artifacts and it's destroyed. Uh, with 10-bit, we can start grading, and from there it only goes up. So high-end cinema cameras will be at like a 15 or 18 bit rate with billions and billions of colors. And with uh, like a Z6 or a DSLR camera, uh, if you're recording in camera, you're looking at generally 8-bit video, which is really only 256 cubed, which is about 16,777 colors. Dithering. Um, that's a funny word, right? Dithering. Dithering is when um, you take a banded photo, like maybe it's 8-bit and you can see the bands in the sky. Well, uh, the computer will try to um, kind of help that gradient and smooth out that gradient by using programming and pixelation. Um, but it's still kind of like a fake, you know, you're still not using all the colors you need. And even if it's dithered, that doesn't mean that in post you're going to be able to push and pull colors any better. When I check in my camera and shoot 8-bit, um, and then I shoot 10-bit, I think I see a difference. Tell me what you guys think. Okay, so now we're looking at 8-bit video. This is 8-bit uh, going actually through the Atomos. Okay, and now using my Z6, I'm gonna go ahead and switch that um, bit rate up to 10-bit quality and a warning comes up telling me that hey i'll record 10 bit but some resolutions i can't record like 4k 60 seconds i can't do that in 10 bit here's the 10 bit video to me the colors look more rich okay wait let's take a quicker look again okay so here is 8 bit all right 8 bit and then 10 bit I'm seeing a huge difference. It almost seems like the 8-bit is out of focus. What is in-log? Well, we talked about shooting RAW and how large the file sizes are when you shoot RAW. Huge, huge files. Well, in-log is a way to shooting and capturing a lot of data, but not shooting RAW. And we can do it with an external recorder. Some cameras can even do it in camera. Uh, Nikon's format for this is called in-log. Um, then you've got Sony's, and Sony's is called S-Log. And then we've got Canon called C-Log, obviously, and then Panasonic is a V-Log. And then even DJI Drones has one called D-Log. 
and you're going to get a much less contrasty image. You can see on the left-hand side of your screen that it looks really washed out. Um, and on the right, you're seeing a regular in-camera profile, maybe standard or neutral or portrait, um, where the color is there. Um, but on the left, you're shooting log, and you're able to retain a lot more in the shadows, a lot of the more detail that can be captured this way. Now, what we want to do is see if you guys can tell the difference between log footage and uh, in-camera profile footage. So I'm going to go ahead and switch my Z6 over and tell it to go ahead and shoot in-log footage. And it gives you a warning and it says, hey, I can't record to this card. I can't, it can't record in the camera in-log. In-log can only be recorded with an external recorder. And here you're seeing a couple of my older lenses. You've got my coffee table area. <laughs> you have my coffee kitchen area. And then there's some um, more footage. And this is all in log. I'm switching over. And what we're going to do is pick neutral. Nikon says neutral is the most realistic looking profile from what our eyes see for their camera. Now, here is neutral color profile, and we're going to take a quicker look. The log footage is more washed out, um, and you can see that here, whereas the in-camera neutral is ready to go. If you're not color grading, use these neutral in-camera profiles. They work great. Chroma subsampling is the idea of color resolution, the amount of color in the photos. People don't generally realize this, but every pixel does not retain color in your photo. Sometimes they're skipped, sometimes several pixels are skipped. So in this example, four, two, zero, which is very common for handheld mirrorless and DSLR cameras, you can see that the middle color palette only has a choice of yellow or magenta, and that the rest of the colors need to be built around that when they're added together. And you can see that as you go up to 411, you have more colors, 422, even more colors, and best 444. That's the most color information that you can get. The Nikon Z6 is 420 in body. With an Atomos, we can, we can shoot at 422, and again, gives us much more flexibility in post, pushing and pulling colors around. Thanks for sticking around for this video. I know I went a little bit long, but I really wanted to get out that information. Um, a lot of it is information I learned after the fact and ended up spending a good amount of money trying to correct it and get the right things that I really need and not just the things people tell me I needed. So um, again, I hope that this is really useful for you. So just to recap, you know, if you're looking to buy a new mirrorless or DSLR camera, a few important things. One, what are you going to be shooting? That's important. You may or may not need a large sensor. Maybe you're shooting indoors in a studio with tons of lighting all the time. And, you know, you don't necessarily need a huge sensor. So it really depends on what you're shooting, what's your subject. Also, don't overthink megapixels. We don't need a million megapixels. And when I say a million, I mean 46 or 45 or even 36. A 24 megapixel camera is going to do you just fine. You're going to be able to do some cropping. You'll still be able to have great resolution if you're going to the web with it, if it's for family or friends or even professional photography. 24 megapixels, unless you're going to be doing real heavy cropping, or unless you plan on printing some monstrous size printout of whatever you're taking a picture of, really those are the only two major reasons why you're gonna need that kind of megapixel. So save yourself some money, get a 24 megapixel or something camera, and um, you're good to go. Then you've gotta ask yourself, am I gonna do video it, it, You know, at all? Maybe you're not gonna do any video and it's not important to you and you just need stills, okay? So it's important to figure that out also, how many card slots are in the camera? Nowadays, they're really trying to make cameras small. They've overdone it, and now they're too small. Some cameras have only one card slot because they're so worried about weight and so worried about size. What I'm expecting we're going to see is I think we're going to start seeing the cameras get a little bit bigger again and go back to being ergonomically correct. 
Right now, when I hold a, a Z camera, my pinky hangs over the bottom. It's not comfortable at all. It's not comfortable at all. When I hold my D850, it feels super comfortable. It feels like an extension of my hand. I love it. So I'd really rather see my cameras have that size rather than just keep getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Also, what about your existing glass? How many lenses do you have? What's the effort going to be if you've got a bunch of Canon glass and, and you're looking to buy into Olympus? You know, are there adapters we can get, like Metabones or something? You know, what size sensor? Do you need full frame or can you get the job done with an APS-C or a Micro Four Thirds? What are you shooting? Maybe, maybe a smartphone's enough. Maybe you just need to take some pictures for your community's church. Once you've answered those questions for yourselves, then you've got to think, okay, well, if I'm going to do some video, what kind of video do I plan on doing? Will I shoot everything with a built-in color profile in my camera? That gives very, really, very good quality. The neutral and portrait and standard profiles built into the cameras do give a really good color palette. Um, and you can use those all day. If you're running and gunning, or if you're just uploading for YouTube, or you want to do some videos for your family around the house, or junior sports games, you're fine with an in-camera color profile. If you want to shoot something professionally that might end up going and getting color graded, or if you want to get involved with that and start learning how to extend the abilities of your camera in post, if you want to be able to have all those additional exposure tools that might not be built into your camera, then that's when you want to start looking at the external recorders. Most cameras don't have waveforms, vectroscopes, false color, zebras. So we want to make sure that you have the tools that you need so when you're making your purchase. These are tools that you're going to want to think about. If you're shooting video, you need these tools to get proper exposures. So keep that in mind. Find out if they're in the camera that you want. If they're not, is there an external recorder that would work well with it that has those tools? But don't expect you're going to get good exposures without them. You need those tools. So in terms of video, in terms of video, the Nikon Z6 is a brick. <laughs> Unless you plan on using an external recorder that has the tools that it takes for you to get a good exposure. So good luck. Happy shopping. I, of course, am a Nikon user and I'm really banking on Nikon stepping it up and keeping up with the Joneses when it comes to video because I really love their interfaces. I love their menu system. I think it's very simple to use and I think that their cameras, especially their D850, is probably the best one on the market for my still photography. Right now they're making great strides in video. I'm going to hang on for the ride and I'm going to be heading up to Buffalo, New York and we're going to take a look at the waterfront. We're going to get out to the Niagara Falls. Hopefully we'll hit Letchworth State Park and uh, show you guys around Western New York and maybe even do a tutorial while we're out there. So thanks for watching and don't forget, please like, comment. I know there's stuff that you wanna talk about, put it below and then subscribe because this is a new channel and there's a lot more to come. I want you guys to be a part of it. Subscribe and we'll see you guys later.